Today, we are back in the Bronx, specifically, the Belmont section. This is part one of this series, so look out for more down the line. We are not going to waste any time, let's jump right into it. Duman, Colin and Cyril, aka Zero, grew up and lived in the same public housing complex. It is known as the Monterey Projects, located in the Bronx between East 180th and East 181st Streets, and Monterey and La Fontaine Avenues. The Monterey Projects consisted of two large three buildings, one with the address of 2111 La Fontaine Avenue, and the other with an address of 558 East 181st Street. Another dude named, Ramos, lived a block away from the Monterey Projects, on East 180th Street. Well Ramos was close friends with Colin, since at least the early 1990s, when they were involved in several shootings and other crimes together, Ramos was not friendly with Zero when they were young. He became close to Zero in the spring of 1998, a few months after Ramos returned to the neighborhood following his imprisonment for several years on unrelated charges. By early 1998, Colin was making a lot of money selling weight, that is, dealing in wholesale quantities or kilograms of narcotics, and also supplying drug spots in the Bronx. Colin's operation, based in the vicinity of 180th Street and Monterey Avenue, distributed cocaine and crack. Colin was the boss of the business and he supplied other dealers with kilogram quantities of drugs. By 1998, Zero was distributing drugs as well, primarily outside of New York City, where he could make a higher profit. In particular, Zero and an associate were using different females to take drugs to Virginia to sell. A witness, we will call, CC, was one of the females Zero used for this purpose. CC grew up in the Monterey projects and was involved for years in a sexual relationship with Zero starting when she was 11 and he was 15 or 16. CC first transported crack for Zero in her about the winter of 1996 when she drove with him to Albany carrying a small ball of crack. Starting in the summer of 1997, CC transported crack to Winchester, Virginia, for Zero between 15 and 20 times, typically secreting the drugs on her person or in her body, and each time receiving a few hundred dollars from Zero. In addition, during the period from 1997 to 2000, when CC herself was selling crack in and around the Monterey projects, at least twice she obtained her supplies of crack from Zero. In the spring of 1998, after Ramos had returned from prison, Zero remarked to Ramos that Colin was caking it, that is, making a lot of money selling cocaine. Zero also made clear that he wanted Colin to hit him off with drugs that Zero could sell outside of New York and asked Ramos to intercede with Colin on Zero's behalf. Ramos agreed, but when he spoke about the subject with Colin, Colin refused to give drugs to Zero and his associates because they were black, while well, Colin was Puerto Rican. He didn't trust them. On the night of July 5, 1998, Ramos and Zero were hanging out in front of the Monterey projects when they overheard Colin having a conversation with a man known as Dylan. Dylan managed a drug spot for Colin. During the conversation, Colin was mad because some guys got into his drug spot and he wanted the guys out of there. Dylan had talked to the intruders already on Colin's behalf without success. Colin then asked Ramos if he would take care of it, which Ramos understood to mean, shoot the guy who was infringing on Colin's spot. Ramos hesitated to take the job, however, and when he did so, Zero spoke up and said, yo, I'll take care of it, I'll handle it. In response to Zero's offer to handle Colin's problem, Dylan noted that the shooter can't be nobody black, Ramos explained that because Dylan, who was African-American, had already approached the intruders at Colin's spot, if something happens and a black guy comes and shoots these guys, Dylan is going to get blamed for it. When Dylan stepped away from the conversation, however, Colin advised Ramos and Zero that he didn't care who handles it as long as they get it done. Ramos and Zero took on the job. Before Ramos and Zero drove off with Dylan, Colin assured them that they would be compensated for their efforts, specifically, Colin agreed to give Ramos funding for an apartment and told Zero, I got you, which Ramos understood to mean that Colin would give Zero some drugs to go out of town. Dylan drove Zero and Ramos to another location in the Bronx, where Dylan retrieved a loaded black 9mm handgun that Ramos placed in his waistband by the small of his back. Dylan then drove to the area of Colin's drug spot on Chisholm Street between Freeman and Jennings Streets. 
As Dylan drove past the spot, Ramo saw several people on the corner, including a man sitting in a beach chair on the sidewalk and woman next to him with a little boy. Dylan told Zero and Ramos that the man in the beach chair, Jamal Kidd, was one of the guys doing the hustling at the spot. Dylan then dropped off Zero and Ramos a block away. As Zero and Ramos walked down the street toward Kidd, Ramos got nervous and wasn't sure if he was going to do it or not. When they were across from Kidd, Ramos pulled the gun out of his waistband and cocked it, but Zero saw that Ramos was hesitant, so Ramos passed the gun to Zero. Zero then began firing away at Kit, who attempted to dodge the bullets and eventually ran away toward Jennings Street. When the shooting started, the woman who had been with Kit put her son against the wall in front of her and covered her son with her whole body facing the wall. Zero kept on shooting till it started clicking, at which point, Ramos took it back from Zero because, as Ramos explained, to Dylan's knowledge, it wasn't supposed to be a black shooter. It was supposed to be a Spanish shooter so Dylan won't get blamed for it. After taking back the gun, Ramo saw that the woman with the small boy was looking at him. Ramos waved her off with the gun in his hand, and she grabbed the kid and went into the building. Ramos and Zero then ran separately back to the meeting point, after which Dylan drove them to another part of the Bronx. Ramos's account of the murder and its backstory was corroborated in almost every detail by Kit's girlfriend at the time of his death, and the woman observed by Ramos and Zero sitting next to Kit, except for one important point. Kit's girl testified that the person who shot Kit was a light-skinned Spanish man and not the Spanish man's black companion. She expressed this while discussing her sales of crack for Dylan and events leading to Kit's murder. In October 1998, she picked a suspect from a photographic array as being the Spanish guy who she claimed was the shooter. The photograph she picked was not Ramos and did not resemble him except in the most general sense. Officers who responded to the scene on July 5, 1998, found Kit collapsed at an intersection one block away from Chisholm Street. Kit was hit by three gunshots and died the next day. A crime scene officer recovered 11 9mm shell casings, all of the same brand, in front of 1306 Chisholm Street. Officers also recovered from Kit's clothing, $121 and two small bags of crack. The day after Kit's murder, Ramos told Ajardo Colon that it was done and that Zero had been the shooter. Ramos also told Colon that he had to take care of Zero by giving him drugs to take out of town. Colon said that he was doing bad with the money right then and to give him a couple of days. Ramos relayed the message to Zero, who was mad at Colon and felt like punching him in the face. As far as Ramos knew, Colon never gave Zero any money or drugs directly for Kit's murder. Roughly three weeks after Kit's murder, in the early morning of July 30, 1998, Ramos was again hanging out with Zero and Colin in front of the Monterey Projects, when two people who also lived in the complex, Terence, aka Tex and Luis, aka Trib, passed by. Tex was a crack dealer who lived in 2111 La Fontaine Avenue with his Dominican girlfriend and sold crack behind the Monterey Projects. Trib grew up and still lived in 558 East 181st Street. When Tex and Trib walked by, Colin remarked to Ramos and Zero, Tex has got to go. In response, Zero asked what's up and said that he would take care of it. Ramos warned Colin in Spanish not to let Zero do the job because Colin had effed up by not giving Zero any money the first time, referring to the kid murder. But Colin assured Ramos, no, I got him. I got him this time. Meaning that Colin was going to hit Zero off with the money and drugs. Colin then took Zero into the 2111 building. Colin called Ramos into the building a few minutes later and took him into the stairwell. There, Ramos saw Zero dressed in a black jeans type jacket with a hood and gloves. At Ramos's suggestion, Colin obtained a bicycle messenger mask for Zero that covered the lower half of his face. Ramos left the others in the stairwell and went to the roof of the nine-story building to locate Tex. Ramos saw Tex in the courtyard behind the 2111 building with his girlfriend, Trib, and other people nearby. Ramos returned to the stairwell, told Zero where Tex was, and told Zero not to go crazy, meaning, don't start shooting at everybody. Ramos and Colin then left after telling Zero to give them enough time to get back to the front of the projects. At the time, Zero had the same gun that he had used to murder Kit. Within two minutes of returning to the front of the building, Ramos and Colin heard a lot of loud shots. They walked around to the rear of the Monterey projects and saw Tex lying dead on the sidewalk. 
Ramos walked to a store on 180th Street, saw the police arrive, and then stayed on the street outside the projects for an hour or more. Eventually, Ramos went inside an apartment on the fourth floor of the 558 building where his friend Monty lived. Ramos saw Zero inside Monty's bedroom and took from him the black hooded jacket that Zero had been wearing, cut it up into pieces, and threw the pieces into the building incinerator. Ramos also told Zero to get rid of the gun, and Zero replied that he would take care of it. Ramos's account of the murder was, again, highly corroborated. Trib testified that he and Tex had been getting high one night in late July 1998, and by roughly 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, they were both in the rear of the Monterey projects. Trib sat down on some steps a few feet away from Tex, and just then someone passed behind Trib and got in back of Tex. As Tex stood up, the man behind him shot Tex through the right side of the face. Tex dropped to the ground, while Trib buckled down, covering his head with his hands as he heard ten or so gunshots. After shooting Tex, the gunman approached Trib and told him not to look at him. Scared that he was going to be shot in the back of the head, Trib did look up and was promptly shot through the upper left eye. Trib ran to the hospital, where he was told that he was lucky to be alive, since the bullet had only narrowly missed his artery. Trib testified that the man who shot him and Tex was wearing a dark denim hoodie suit. Policeman Terry Poole was the first officer to arrive at the scene, between one and three minutes after the shooting occurred. Poole saw a black man lying on the sidewalk in the rear courtyard of the Monterey Projects, with an Hispanic woman later identified as Tex's girlfriend, kneeling over him. The victim was laying in a pool of blood with multiple gunshot wounds so recent that they were still actively bleeding. Poole asked the woman if she saw what had happened, and she pointed to the rear of 2111 La Fontaine and said that a male, black, dressed in all black, had just shot her boyfriend, and he ran into the rear of 2111 La Fontaine. Police efforts to locate the shooter in that building were unsuccessful. Tex was pronounced dead at the scene. The medical examiner testified that Tex had been shot a total of 13 times, including three times in the head. NYPD recovered 13 discharged 9mm shell casings from the area around Tex's body, as well as several crack vials. A ballistics expert testified that the shell casings were fired from the same gun as those recovered from the scene of the Jamal Kid homicide. CC found out that Tex had been killed behind her building on the morning after the murder. A few days later, Zero came over to CC's apartment and the two got intimate. Afterward, she asked Zero, referring to Tex, why did you do that to that boy? Zero was shocked and asked CC, how did you know? CC told Zero that her friend had told her. Zero was angry and left CC's apartment shortly thereafter. Around the same time, Zero had given CC some clothes to throw in the garbage. The clothes included a black shirt, black pants, and black boots. CC threw them into the incinerator. After Zero killed Tex, Ramos learned from both Colin and Zero that Colin gave Zero drugs as payment for the murder. Sanford Malone was the leader of a large-scale retail drug organization based on Hughes Avenue in the Bronx. They were known as the Hughes Boys. The Hughes boys controlled the sale of crack, heroin, and cocaine in the vicinity of Hughes Avenue and East 178th Street from at least in or about the late 1980s through at least the spring of 2001. Malone was the Hughes boys' founder and its undisputed leader until his death. Over the years, the Hughes boys employed dozens of people as pitchers, managers, and drug baggers. At times in the late 1990s, the Hughes boys sold as much as a kilogram or more of crack per week, and the organization protected its lucrative drug territory with multiple firearms, to which Hughes boys members had ready access. Malone held sway over other local drug dealers because he had a reputation around the neighborhood for being fierce and for scaring everybody. Indeed, it was rumored that Malone had killed a lot of people in the 1980s. Edwin Avillas took control of the retail drug operation on Monterey Avenue between East 178th and 179th Streets in or about the early 1990s and ran it until his arrest in October 2002. Avillas's organization sold crack, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana and employed many different workers at any given time. On a daily basis, Avillas's crew sold between 5 and 60 bundles of crack, each containing roughly $20-$10 bottles or bags, up to 50 or 60 $20 bags of cocaine, and up to 50 or 60 bundles of heroin, each containing 10-$10 wax paper bags. 
Avilas, too, possessed numerous guns, which he provided to his workers to protect his block. Avilas also employed muscle, including Ramos, to handle a problem if he needed somebody to get beat up or killed. The consensus in the neighborhood was that Malone personally did not like or respect Avilas, and that Avilas and his crew feared Malone. Avilas knew that Malone was angry with him for, among other things, selling heroin on Hughes Avenue when Malone was in jail. Avilas admitted that he was afraid of Sanford Malone, and the same appeared to be true for the rest of Avilas's crew. Perhaps knowing this, Malone taunted and disrespected Avilas and his men. For example, in the late 1990s, Malone began an affair with a woman who lived on Monterey Avenue in the heart of Avilas's territory, and started using her apartment as a stash for the Hughes boys' drug business. On one occasion during this period, Malone tailgated Avilas's car through their neighborhood, and then, after Avilas parked in front of his own building, threatened Avilas through the open car window, don't be scared, yet. On another occasion, in or about 1999, Malone pistol-whipped a leading member of Avilas's crew on the head on Monterey Avenue, in full view of many members of both organizations. As a result of these and other confrontations, Ramos wanted to kill Sanford Malone before he killed any of them. But Avilas would not let Ramos kill Malone for fear that Avilas would be blamed for it. In late 1999, Ramos finally persuaded Avilas at least to consider devising a plan to murder Malone. Ramos told Avilas, it's time for us to kill the man, because, you know, his intention is to kill you. Accordingly, Avilas met with Ramos and Zero in Avilas's car, and they discussed a plan to murder Malone. The scheme called for Zero and an associate to shoot Malone on Hughes Avenue, and then escape through a building with access to the adjoining avenue, where Avilas and Ramos would be waiting in a car to drive them away. The thought was that, because Zero and his associate were both black, the Hughes boys would not know that Malone's killing had been solicited by Avilas and Ramos, who were both Spanish. In the end, however, Avilas felt bad vibes, got cold feet, and rejected the plan. There was no further serious discussion of killing Malone until the evening of February 14, 2000, when Avilas, Ramos, and other members of Avilas's crew attended a wake for one of their associates at a funeral home on Bathgate Avenue, between 178th Street and Tremont Avenue. This associate for which the funeral was being had, Moses Soto, was an up-and-coming thug who had got killed by a domino playing loan shark. The lone shark was supposed to pay for damages inflicted to Moses's car, in exchange for him to not involve police. After waiting several weeks for reimbursement, he robbed the lone shark spot and gained north of $40,000, easy. He did manage to move him and his moms out the hood almost immediately, but on February 11, 2000, he would find himself parked up on Monterey Avenue in his green Nissan. The lone shark approached and an argument ensued. The lone shark shot Moses, who was also armed, in the face with a 380. Thereafter, the lone shark would go home and blow his own brains out, perhaps not wanting to do jail. Malone, who had once employed Moses as a drug pitcher, also attended the wake, arriving in his gold Cadillac with his second-in-command, Angel. While inside the funeral home, Malone refused to take off his hat and behaved in other ways that Avilas and Ramos found to be rude and disrespectful. In addition, after leaving the wake, Malone stood with Cordero and others next to his Cadillac, parked across the street from the funeral home in front of a church, blasting rap music from his stereo and dancing. Eventually, Ramos and Avilas discussed what if anything they should do about Malone in light of his behavior. While the two witnesses differed as to whose idea it was, both Ramos and Avilas testified that they ultimately agreed to solicit Zero to murder Malone then and there, at the wake. Ramos persuaded Avilas that while Zero was shooting Malone outside on the street, Avilas and Ramos would be inside the funeral home where everyone could see them, so that we ain't go to worry about people saying we had something to do with it. Ramos left the funeral home to meet with Zero in the lobby of 558 East 181st Street, where he told Zero that DJ Ed wanted Zero to take care of Malone at the wake. But Zero said he didn't know if he was going to do it and would get back to Ramos. Ramos returned to the funeral home and related his conversation with Zero to Avilas. Ramos also told Avilas that if Zero did take care of it, Avilas would have to give Zero money to leave town. CC was in her apartment at 558 East 181st Street when she received a telephone call from Zero, asking her to come downstairs to the fourth floor. CC went to the apartment of Zero's friend Monty and found Zero in Monty's bedroom. Zero asked her to get her jacket so she could take a walk with him. 
CC did as requested and returned to Monty's. Zero had put on a black jacket and a black scully. Zero and CC left the building and walked west on 181st Street, making a left on Bathgate Avenue. They walked three blocks south on Bathgate to 178th Street, where Zero turned right and took CC toward the middle of the block. Zero stopped and told CC to turn around, she then heard the sound of a gun being cocked. According to CC, she did not know what was about to happen, but was scared, nervous, thinking a million things. CC did not run away, however, explaining that she knew the gun was loaded and I didn't want Cyril to shoot me, and I was scared. Instead, CC said nothing to Zero and just proceeded on down Bathgate. Inside the funeral home, Ramos received a beep on his pager and used Avila's cell phone to call the return number. Zero answered the call and asked Ramos, who is it, the guy that's dancing on the stairs? Ramos responded, yup, and Zero said, all right. Moments later, the people inside the funeral home heard gunshots ring out from the street. Amid the panic, Ramos and Avilas went outside with the other mourners. Avilas saw Malone on the ground near his car. Ramos saw Angel with a bullet hole through his neck and Avilas saw another man, Hollow, who had been shot in the leg and was screaming. CC and eyewitness, Stuart, explained how it happened. As CC and Zero proceeded down Bathgate Avenue, she saw a funeral home on the other side of the street and 15 to 20 people outside of it. Up ahead on her side of the street, CC saw three men standing on the steps of a church, bopping to rap music on the radio. The three men were Stuart, Malone, and Angel. When they were close to where Stuart and the others were standing on the church steps, Zero gave CC a final instruction. Zero told me when he pulls the gun out of his pocket for me to step in the street. But CC did not even have time to follow that instruction before Zero started shooting. Stuart saw the first shot hit Angel, and the next shot hit Malone. After that it went bang bang bang, and Stuart ran down the steps behind Zero and dove on the ground behind Malone's car. CC heard Zero fire at least 10 shots as she stumbled into the street. Zero then ran past CC and thrust the gun into her chest, before he continued the short distance down to Tremont Avenue, on the next corner. CC was shocked and held onto the gun. She too, continued down to Tremont and caught a cab back to the Monterey projects. Stewart waited until the gunshots had stopped and then ran to the funeral home for help. Stewart and others picked up Malone's body and drove it in Malone's car to the hospital. Officers who responded to the scene of the shooting found mass confusion, with people running in all different directions. Crime scene detectives recovered 14 discharged 9mm shell casings from the area around the church on Bathgate Avenue, all of which were fired from the same gun. Malone was shot a total of seven times, including in the chest, through the neck, and just above his right eye, and died at the hospital. Angel was shot through the neck, but survived. Upon returning to the Monterey projects, CC went into apartment 4J at 558 East 181st Street and there saw Zero and Monty. CC unzipped her jacket and Zero took the gun out. Although she was angry, upset, surprised, mad, and felt like shit, CC said nothing to Zero at the time and thereafter continued to have a sexual relationship with him. Following the shooting, Ramos left Bathgate Avenue and went over to Avilas's building on Monterey. Ramos told Avilas to get some money and Avilas went into his apartment and came back with $800. An hour or so later, Ramos met with Zero in the hallway on the fourth floor of 558 East 181st Street and gave Zero the $800. Zero told Ramos that Malone was dancing on the steps and that when Zero approached him Malone tried to grab Angel, which was why Angel got shot. A lot of these guys got a lot of time, some didn't because of cooperation. Zero was sentenced to life prison terms. This pretty much wraps up the story though. Before we go, we want you to hear some words from Zero regarding this case and what happened from his point of view. We found this on change.org, here's what he had to say. I was convicted of a drug conspiracy that they say I was part of from 1998 until 2002. The reason for that timeline is they wanted to charge me with murders that was during that time period. They charged me with a drug conspiracy but never showed that I was a part of it. They then changed gears and said that the murders are what got me in the conspiracy. The law says in order for you to further a conspiracy you must first be a part of it. Since I had been arrested and convicted before for other crimes the jury didn't have a problem with me going back to jail. 
I never was arrested nor convicted for drugs prior to this charge. I was never a suspect or a person of interest for none of these crimes until the people that cooperated with the government added me in the loop. When they were asked if they ever seen me with drugs they answered no. When they were asked if I ever sold drugs with them or for them they said no therefore the drug conspiracy never took place with me and them. The murders were all seen by different witnesses that all picked someone else out for the murders that do not even come close to looking like me nor have my height or body weight at the time. On one murder the jury found me not guilty of, but then found me guilty of the gun which still gave me the same charge of murder. There was a young lady I was in a relationship with that testified about one of the murders, she was forced by the government. On three occasions they made her come to their office where she informed them each time she knew nothing about the crimes. The last time they threatened her with taking her daughter and giving her a gun charge. This is illegal for the government to do, but I did not have the information at the time to prove that they did that though. Basically the whole thing is because I would not fold they gave me everything, but yeah, this is the end of the story. As always, stay low and thanks for watching. According to Cyril, and those who have taken time to review his paperwork, there are discrepancies within the case. We are not in the business of exonerating people, but if you know anyone who is and might be interested in this story, hit superwariobro100 at gmail.com. It is in the description. Cyril has some words addressing a story put out by Super Wario Bro, and also wants to express his perspective on how things really went down. Here are some words from Cyril. For some odd reason, the story of rights or the government fucking people over is always told like they did the right thing. Hindsight is 2020, so I see everything nice and clear on this side of things. With that being said, let's address the story that's being pushed. At some point in 2002, Edwin Navillas was arrested by the feds for a drug conspiracy. The feds had audio and video of what was going on on his block. Some of his people flipped and helped the feds with the case they already had on him. Being the coward he is, he flipped and told on his so-called friend, Ralphie Ramos. In short, he got caught doing whatever crimes he was doing then decided paying for his actions was not going to happen. How many people he told on to get the 60 years he was facing dropped down to eight? I don't know. The one thing I do know is Ralphie was on Rikers Island for a body that one of his people told him about. Somehow, Ralphie was able to give the feds information that got him from state charges to federal. They both told the feds all kind of lies, attempting to get out of the jail time for their own shit. Thanks to the way the federal system is, they didn't need evidence nor any solid proof to pass the burden on to another or several others. I was one of those people, unfortunately. If you remove my name, any other stand-up man from the hood could be placed there, and they will be explaining this story the same way from behind these walls. Me and Edwin Navillas was never friends or in any kind of business together, which is in the paperwork. Me and Ralphie knew each other from being in the same hood for years, and we were not friends. These two cowards took some street shit and used it to their advantage. To set the record straight, nobody from the projects was beefing with the dudes from Hughes at no point in time back then. Edwin the Villas is from the poor side of Monterey, named after the well-filled buildings on the corner of the block. Some of the confusion can be from that. Even though he expressed his fear of Malone, if they had any real beef, I doubt he would have just moved around like nothing was going on, if it was. I didn't know the man, didn't fear the man, or have any issues with him or anybody from his block. There were eyewitnesses that seen the whole murder play out, yet the feds took a story from two scared dudes that was inside with no way to see what took place. The story of these two suckers getting fed up is bullshit, and them being able to get me to kill somebody for them is even more bullshit. Before the story was given to the feds, I was not a suspect or even a person of interest. There was not many people around those areas that didn't know my face, so trust, if it was me, I would have either been arrested or had a warrant out for my arrest. There was two people that told the NYPD they seen the person who did the actual murder, and they picked somebody from out of a lineup for it. That didn't matter to the feds, though, because they took the word of two rodents over the people that was right there when it happened. Now for the murder in the back of the projects. I didn't know that guy either. However, since I was around there, I did see him several times. 
He had a girlfriend that lived in one of the buildings. There was a few people around when he was murdered, all of which I'm sure knew me, yet not one of them told the police it was me. I was never a suspect or person of interest yet again. The coward Ralphie said it was me after he decided to be a whore for the feds. The story is, I did the murder for drugs that I was supposed to get from yet another coward that told on some dudes that took his car from him. Evan Cologne is his name. Again, there were eyewitnesses that seen the whole thing and described a short Hispanic guy as the shooter. That's just a strange coincidence. The person telling the feds the story is a short Hispanic guy, Coward Ralphie. Not suspect or person of interest for this murder either. The last thing to address is the girl you decided to name Cece. We did have a sexual relationship, and we'll go a step further and say it was more than that, even though it was not spoken by either of us. She was forced to lie to the government because the little coward Ralph got her in this story with his bullshit. I'm sure they used the one thing that would make any mother play along, which is her child. At trial, the government admits she told them twice she didn't know anything. So why was she back at the office a third or a fourth time? This was not a case where I got caught doing a crime and attempted to get out of a jam. I was straight railroaded because I would not bend and help the feds fuck up some other people's lives. Hopefully, all the people that have an opinion based on the two coward story will take a moment next time and think about it being two sides to a story. I don't expect this to be accepted by anybody. I just hope it makes them stop and think instead of just going along with the first thing they hear or see. The truth don't need support, and my story will remain the same till my time is up on this point. It's been almost 20 years, and I lost some loved ones and others over the years. Most importantly, I lost so much time with my family. The rats don't care about how many people's lives they fuck up. As long as they got out of the jam they was in. Keep that in mind next time you hear a rat story. Hashtag hostage lives matter.